Next we have uh, Hans, who is going to tell us why uh, all the stuff we've heard about so far is just purely evil and wicked. Then we'll have a, a nice free-form discussion. And uh, towards the end of that discussion, we're going to take a chance to see who wants to do a group dinner tonight and try to organize a dinner. Thank you. So, uh, and also if you're talking in the afternoon, uh, remember your time slots include uh, time for questions, and if you use it all up with the paper, uh, you're depriving yourself of hearing uh, some of the questions you'll get. So thanks again, and without further ado, take it away, Hans. Okay, thanks. Uh, so actually, I should prefix this by saying I think the, this talk and the previous ones are actually somewhat reconcilable with some uh, with some traditions, and we'll get there here. Uh, first of all, I should start that, uh, by saying that I have no objection to non-deterministic programs. In fact, I think low-level non-determinism is essential. Uh, we use it all the time. When we call a memory allocator, the address we get back is likely to be non-deterministic in a way that's not easily avoidable. We use, use counters that uh, are incremented in a non-deterministic order and so on. And uh, that's, that's all fine. Some of the talks that were given here earlier, I think, present arguments for non-determinism at, at higher levels as well. But uh, at least sort of by my definitions, none of these actually involve what I call data races. So what do I mean by data races? So what I, what I mean by data races is what I believe is now actually the standard definition. Uh, and I think it's essentially what's been the definition all along. We say that uh, that two memory accesses conflict if the order in which they're executed matters, essentially. If they access the same memory location and one of them is a right. Uh, a program is defined to, be a, to have a data race if it has two such conflicting memory accesses, two memory accesses for which the order matters and the order isn't determinate, as they can potentially occur simultaneously. Uh, a program is defined to be data race free, on, and implicitly, usually, we mean on a particular input, if there's no sequentially consistent execution. Or if, actually, I should, I'll qualify this a little bit later. Usually, we say no sequentially consistent execution. Actually, I think for the models I'm talking about, it's no execution according to the whatever the specified execution semantics are, which are usually by default sequentially consistent. Um, so with this definition of databases, my position here isn't very original. So there was already this one-page article in CACM a while back, which was a perspective for something else with the title, Databases are evil with no exceptions, which is sort of the same point I'm making here. Uh, what do you mean by exceptions? Like exceptions that get thrown? Or uh, that no. <laughs> <laughs> in all cases. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so why are data races evil? Well, first of all, if you look at official programming language definitions, they're generally effectively outlawed. And I'll go through some examples of this. So in particular, most of the mainstream programming languages that we use to write high performance programs in particular, and some that we don't, actually uh, define data races the same way that they handle out of bound subscript errors. Uh, there are errors in the same sense that out of bounds of AF references are errors. Uh, and I also argue that uh, in, this is not just a formality in practice. In fact, compilers, if you write programs with data races by this definition, uh, the compiler is fairly likely to actually break your code. The probability depends on how exactly the details of the data races, but this, uh, there's a reasonable chance that it will just break in, as in cache or the like. Uh, also, data races in this sense are in fact easily avoidable in languages like, uh, like the new C and C++ standards, uh, which sort of gets us back to the earlier talks. I think these avoidance mechanisms, I think, can all be easily incorporated into what you heard earlier. Uh, I'll also argue that data races in this sense, actually, uh, in introducing data races in this sense doesn't actually improve scalability in, in spite of what you heard earlier. Um, so going through some of the just the existing state of language standards and so on, if you look at the new C++ standards, uh, it sort of unambiguously says that any data race results in undefined behavior. Uh, that isn't very original. If you look at the ADA 83 definition, uh, the rules are a little bit harder to follow and they're stated in ways that are no longer sort of very current. 
Uh, on the other hand, it says the same thing. The execution of the program is erroneous if any of these assumptions is, val is violated. And these assumptions basically amount to an absence of data erases. The, the previous slide, it seems like you had a different definition for data erase. You mentioned the word atomic, which was not on the slide for your original definition. Um, One of which is not atomic. Uh, yeah, I'll get around to what that is, uh, what that is later. And I think that's important. Stay tuned. Uh, so actually ADA has the same, it turns out ADA, at least later versions of ADA have a similar notion. So that, that's also, that's not really a substantive difference between the languages here. But, uh, if we look at the POSIX thread standard, it says, says something, uh, it says something very similar, no thread of control can read or modify a memory location while, any, while another thread of control may be modifying it which is also sort of no data races rule. Data races are erroneous. Uh, if we look at Java, the situation is a little bit different and more complicated. I won't spend much time on it. Data races in Java are technically not errors. On the other hand, it turns out that the Java memory model actually doesn't tell you what they mean, so you still don't know what they mean. They're not officially undefined behavior, but they're undefined because the definition doesn't make sense. Uh, so the point in all of this is that in all of these languages is basically that the absence of data races in this sense is sort of the minimum guarantee you need to promise same semantics of the programming language. Uh, so does this actually matter in practice? Well, I have a few simple, uh, simple examples here to show you that it actually does matter in practice. Uh, so this is perhaps sort of too simple a use case. I think a lot of people have run into this one already. On the other hand, it illustrates a lot of the problems quite well. So if I just use a data race here to communicate that I'm done doing something in one thread so that another thread can use it. So in this, in this case, I set x to 42 and then say I'm done setting x and the other thread waits for done to be set and checks that x is actually equal to 42. Can that fail? Sure. Yeah. Sure, right. And it can fail in practice actually for a whole bunch of different reasons as it turns out. Uh, so the one that, you've uh, that many of you have probably encountered is this further compiler transformation that the compiler decides that well done this loop invariant. So I only have to load it once at the beginning of the loop and can then check the temporary through the rest of the loop. Which means that if done isn't initially set the first time you read it, you've just introduced an infinite loop. And this, this sort of problem is introduced by the compiler uh, it also turns out that the compiler can decide, well, I'm setting X and I'm setting down, those are independent. So therefore, it's perfectly fine to reorder them and do them in the opposite order. Uh, in which case, again, I can, when I see down set, it's not necessarily the case that X is actually equal to 42. Uh, and that can be done by the compiler. It also turns out that a lot of architectures can do this under the covers, even if the compiler doesn't do it. Uh, there's a more subtle transformation. There's yet another way in which this can break, which again has to do with sort of hardware reordering, which is a little harder to express in the source language. It can also be the case that on the reader side here, that the final load of done that actually sees done set, and the load of x below it here are reordered by the hardware, in which case, again, you might see done set, but x not equal to 42. Uh, before you leave that example, if I follow all the recommendations in Paul's uh, PerfMem book, or MemPerf, whatever, and you know, say these things are volatile and I use the right memory barrier instructions, do you still think of that as a data race? Because then this thing won't fail. Uh, we actually still think of that as a data race. I mean, it's still defined to be a data race if we take this as C11 and C11 code. But that's a more, that's a more complicated discussion. I mean, you, there, are set, there are alternate sets of rules that you can follow with that will be sufficient to guarantee that it works correctly on most current compilers. Okay, but you still think of that as a race? Uh, I still th think of that as still a race. Evil. And there are technical reasons why C11 and C11, if you, you recommend in that book that you use volatile, right? So that's. Well, I, I have to, well, the thing is, I have to tell people what to do with current compilers. And I actually think C and C11's rules will make things better. Right. And when I 
think that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good point. And uh, in fact, I mean, the, those, the techniques there are sort of a great workaround for what we have now. Uh, they don't work in 100% of all cases because there's some esoteric compilers that will uh, may split pointers across uh, cache line boundaries or something, and for those, it, it won't work. But, and those are legal compilers, so. Maybe legal, but not smart. Legal, but not smart, perhaps, yes. Um, and there are other things that can fail. So here's another example. If I load, if I have a racing load, X is changing here because it's being modified by another thread. I load it into a local variable temporary. Then I, depending on the value of temporary, I do one thing and then do a compensating action at the end. I may end up executing one but not the other because my clever compiler may decide that it needs to spill the value of temporary and it knows that temp uh, temporary and X are the same, so it'll just reload it the second time. And that's actually a legal compiler optimization. And I'm told that GCC is actually capable of doing that. Uh, so that's not going to necessarily going to lead to good results here. <laughs> uh, uh, there are other kinds of other reasons this may fail. I mean, as I just mentioned, you can actually end up reading half a pointer in a conforming C implementation. Uh, that won't happen in Java, but in, in C that's legal. Uh, in C, at least, you can again, uh, well, C++ actually, uh, C there are no method table pointers. In, in C++, you can end up reading an uninitialized method table pointer as a result of a database and take a wild branch. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other examples of that. In fact, uh, I had a paper in Hot Power 11 sort of illustrating why all the so-called benign kinds of benign databases that people have discussed in the literature actually will break under some circumstances, including redundant rights of the same value by different threads, mm -hmm. which you wouldn't expect to break. Um, so how do we fix this? In C11 and C11, there are actually two sort of main ways of fixing this. We've primarily been talking about the first one here, which are locks. The other method is you can declare you can declare variables to be atomic, or you can, or you can declare objects in general to be atomic, which means they provide you sort of indivisible operations. You're guaranteed not to read half the value, uh, half an updated value, uh, and these oper the operations on atomics are treated as synchronization operations, not as data operations. So they don't introduce data races, but by by having these execute concurrently, you may still uh, you may still encounter other kinds of races, and you may clearly sort of violate atomicity constraints that you need. So these are fairly low-level mechanisms. It does nothing but eliminate data races per se. Uh, but the main consequence it has, or one of the major consequences it has, is that it tells the compiler that there's a race there. So that it has to generate code that actually deals with the fact that there may be concurrent accesses to that variable. Uh, so if we want to fix some of the examples, and I think the same thing applies to some of the earlier talks, uh, we can fix this fairly easily uh, using the C, C11 or C++ 11 mechanism, C++ C++ syntax. We can just declare the done flag to be atomic, since the, this program really only has a race on the done flag. Uh, that informs the compiler that done is accessed concurrently. It also, in this case, ends up informing the compiler that it has to generate the right code so that we preserve sequential consistency in spite of this race. Why is the race only on done? I'm sorry, no, not on X as well? Or uh, both are either? Because the race is, de race is defined uh, to mean that there can be essentially simultaneous accesses in, a, in the easy case, in the, way the easy case here, in a sequentially consistent execution. Is it correct that there would be a race on both of them initially, but if you make done atomic, there is now no race on uh, Well, typically, if we define a race, we only talk about sequentially consistent executions when defining a race, okay. or, or race, uh, well, actually, it, um, we'll that's what in C++ actually is the case here, that if you didn't make done atomic, there would be a race on the, uh, the other one, right? So, so the, technically, if you look at the language definitions, then, then done actually, making done atomic removes the other race because it orders the accesses to X. So I, I got a real quick question here. Yeah. So assigning the atomicity to the 
I think that's a good lead into the next slide. Uh, so if you actually don't want that, there, there, there are versions of these operations that give you more precise control. If you declare this as atomic, uh, but then explicitly specify the kind of memory ordering that you need, uh, you, can, uh, you can, I think, get what you want, uh, which is that you can actually tell the compiler precisely what kind of ordering is required. I think for most of the discussion so far, we've been assuming sequential consistency to make the reasoning valid. But in this particular case, you can compile, tell the compiler that in order to make this uh, work correctly, I only need to ensure that memory operations before the store is done uh, become visible to any code that happens after the load that sees that value. And there's a way to, to say that in C++11. Sure, but th th there's still some stuff left implicit, and I, I have a lack of control. Maybe I only care about certain of the rights before they become visible. You can mark them differently if you want, including saying the order or whatever, and still have it be atomic and, and EDD. So, so yeah. you say, I want at, at this right, I want yeah. this right to be ordered before this read, and these five rights before that have that same order. Uh, you can't do that, and there are good arguments you don't, I would claim you don't want to do that. Uh, but we can discuss that offline. What he, 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 he said, maybe he is satisfied by the sum of defenses. The defenses in C++ might do that. Uh, I think he actually wanted more precise rather than less. He wanted an even smaller hammer, sort of as, in, as you get in OpenMP currently. But I mean, nobody knows how to use those things correctly. So we can discuss that later. That's sort of. Yeah, I think you're trying to get back to your slides. Right. Uh, uh, so the question is sort of how much does this kind of synchronization actually cost? Um, and here I'm actually talking about different kind of organism, different kind of synchronization than most of the earlier papers. In that I'm talking about synchronization that's used to avoid data erases, not to give you larger blocks of atomic, uh, atomic execution, which is what the earlier papers were generally talking about. So if you purely introduce locks to introduce data erases, uh, or introduce atomic variables. Well, it turns out if we look at atomics here, first atomic stores with any ordering constraint except, except the default sequentially consistent constraint, which I don't actually have to write explicitly, uh, actually end up imposing nothing but mild compiler constraints. So those are relatively cheap. Um, it actually turns out that in a case in the cases we've been talking about, if databases actually give you the right answer, uh, then you can specify ordering constraints here that are sufficiently weak uh, so that you can essentially generate the same code. Uh, so it costs you essentially nothing. Uh, atomic loads on, uh, uh, on x86, again, impose a sort of, even for the sequentially consistent ones, impose only compiler ordering constraints. They don't actually generate any additional code. Um, so the question is, if we look at sort of other kinds of synchronization, how much does it cost? Um, and I'll give you some number, I'll give you some numbers in a second here too. We actually kind of have to split that into two different issues. It turns out if you have something, if you want to synchronize something that's currently only reading, that's currently only loading, and you want to put a lock around it, that may in fact cost you significantly, and I think every, most people here are aware of that. Because by introducing a lock, you're introducing a store, you're introducing a potential cache contention into a place that was previously only loading, only reading, and previously had no cache contention, previously could use shared accesses. Um, so I don't really want to talk about that very much in this, but on the other hand, except to point out that if you actually have something that's only loading and you can write code with data bases that actually seems to work, um, then, uh, then we can also write the same code with atomics, only it will be more correct and, and it'll give you, well, it'll give you stronger semantics with essentially no overhead. Hans, just to clarify by atomic there, you might mean the atomic instructions in the hardware or the atomic label in C++11? Uh, really, I mean, they're, they're closely related, but I mean the atomic label in C++11. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, uh, so here we actually focus on, on critical sections that might. Just, yep. just to 
larger coherence bandwidth is also an issue. So even if you're successful in breaking up your fine grain blocks, the fact that you've got to shuttle them around is still a problem. Yeah. Uh, right, and we'll get there. Okay. So, in fact, so I'll give you sort of a proof by by one toy example here. But uh, so I, I'll look at this particular algorithm here, which is uh, essentially one that we used in PLBIO5, which has been modified. Uh, so it's a simple Anatosthenes example. It's been modified to always unconditionally write the bit, which is really a byte in the array that's being updated. Uh, the array of composite number of, uh, yeah, I, the, the composite bit array essentially. Uh, we took this example, we ran it on a 32 core machine, eight processors, four cores each. Um, unfortunately, at least at the time, the C11 atomics implementations left something to be desired, so this was all done sort of with, with hand emulation essentially, generating the equivalent code. Um, we looked at various ways of removing the data, of implementing get and set here so that either there was a database or it turns out actually using memory ordering lacks, using the weakest memory ordering specification in C++ and Latin essentially generates the same code as the database. So I, I've only graphed those two together uh, and we've implemented get and set using atomics and locks as the two options. And what you get well, if you look at the one and two core numbers, uh, you in fact get sort of what you expect. If you lock get and set using a mutex, uh, you have significant overhead. If you use sequentially consistent atomics, it's on an x86 processor, it turns out uh, those add overhead to stalls, and we only do stalls. So in fact, those add quite a bit of overhead as well, and you see that here. Uh, and using a plain stall, which corresponds to either using a database, or in this case, which happens to work in this case, or using a uh, memory order relax operation, in fact, is significantly faster. But if we look at what happens with higher processor accounts, the story actually looks somewhat different. Uh, basically, all the overhead that's introduced in acquiring a lock or inserting the fence in order to implement the sequentially consistent atomic stall is stuff that's essentially done, uh, that's essentially parallelizable. It's done by individual calls. Uh, so what happens is here we have the sort of basic or memory order uh, relaxed version. This is the sequentially consistent version, which is barely higher and actually looks to me almost like it's approaching the first one because the memory traffic is the same. Uh, and here we have the locked version and this is actually a version that has had the, the mapping to locks a little bit tuned so it actually, from what's in the paper. So this actually, the difference here is actually quite small because the overhead again is really parallelizable. Uh, so the issue here is that really the contention is on, on memory bandwidth in this case. Uh, the atomics add this mfence instruction to the code which on x86 flushes the store buffer which has nothing to do with any other, uh, any other calls basically. Uh, locking adds fences in some memory traffic, but there are a lot fewer locks than byte array entries. So, in fact, the effect here is relatively minor. So, is uh, a quick question about this? Yeah. So, isn't the um, memory consistency model on this particular processor almost a bunch of consistency? Isn't it TSO? Uh, it's TSO, yeah. but it, that's not, not quite, that's significantly different from sequential consistency. But for the purposes of most of the stuff we're talking about here, it's this close. I don't, right? uh, it it means that stalls actually for this purpose no because the this is stall heavy. If it, this were load heavy code, you'd be right. No, no, but uh, well, anyway. So, so let's say I'm happy with TSO because I think because there's a lot of the papers that say I, I can reason in a memory in a sequential consistency and the proof goes over immediately to TSO. And the, well, there's a lot of difficulty in that step, but. No, but they, they got some cock proof or whatever, right? So, but, but, but I get, but, but this Th that's a different discussion, but yes. Okay. okay. But, but here's my point, right? My point is the guys who are building this, this processor implemented this sequential consistency thing in a very efficient way. And the reason they did that is because they don't expect to see a lot of code that has this. So even though, and, and that's why you're getting this huge overhead from this sequential consistency. So this is a big problem for adding these kind of things to systems. 
mind, that's a, that's a complicated issue, actually, and I think it's changing significantly. So, in fact, if you look at mainstream processes, which are, I mean, for most of us are either x86 or ARM, uh, currently, for ARM, the story is significantly different, but it's actually becoming much closer to this in the future. So, let's, let's give Hans an extra minute or two. And okay, let me finish up here quickly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I have to say I, I, I have lots of objections stacked up to disagree, but I'm so grateful you came and gave this great presentation on this view, and, and I mean, what I think doesn't really matter that much. It's a great talk. Thanks again. And now uh, it's time. Do you want to say anything? Uh, no, okay. I'm fine. <laughs>